Hi, and welcome to the 2000 AD Thrillcast. This will be a different episode to normal because of the terrible and shocking news of the death of Steve Dillon, one of the all-time great 2000 AD artists. Steve passed away in New York uh, the other week at the age, a terribly young age of uh, 54 um, from the complications of a, a burst appendix. And um, everybody who knew him, everybody who was a fan, um, has been left utterly devastated by this unexpected loss. So this episode of the Thrillcast is dedicated to Steve and uh, we're going to be talking to uh, the people who knew him, who worked with him uh, both at 2000 AD and afterwards, and uh, really get a sense of um, the great loss that all these people have suffered and our industry as well. Because uh, Steve was one of the definitive artists on 2000 AD. He was uh, a titan. Strips such as City of the Damned, Cry of the Werewolf, Alabama Blimps, Oz, Emerald Isle. Uh, he also worked on uh, Tyranny Rex, uh, Rogue Trooper, Harlem Heroes. He was known for his work on Warrior Magazine. It was edited by Des Skin. He created uh, uh, um, Deadline Magazine with fellow 2000 AD artist Brett Ewins. And he went on to work with uh, Garth Ennis, not just on uh, stories such as Emerald Isle for uh, for 2000 AD, but also uh, the uh, critically acclaimed Preacher series, which has been turned into a TV series. Um, he attended New York Comic Con uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, and uh, everybody who saw him commented uh, how much better he looked after years of, uh, of ill health, and uh, it's a real shock. So this episode of the 2080 Thrillcast is uh, all about Steve and uh, his amazing artwork, but also his incredible friendship. It's fair to say that Steve Dillon was a unique talent, not just because of the consistency of his work, not just because of the incredible storytelling uh, and uh, line work that he produced, but the fact that he started working in comics at the tender age of 16, um, working on uh, Hulk Weekly for Marvel UK uh, before moving on to Warrior and then 2000 AD. Richard Burton was uh, assistant editor and then editor of uh, of 2000 AD during the 1980s, which was uh, the uh, the heyday of Steve's work for the Galaxy's Greatest. And uh, it's wonderful to welcome him to the Thrillcast talk uh, about his memories of Steve. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, let's talk about. Well, we're here to talk about Steve. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, very very sad. I only got the news this week. I was I was shocked. I mean, way too young to go. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I don't think there's anybody uh, who who hasn't been left absolutely stunned uh, by by what has happened. Um, what was your first encounter with Steve? <laughs> My first encounter, as far as I can remember, it was in a bookshop. And I think it was Forbidden Planet, the original incarnation of it in London, in mm. Denmark Street. And Steve was uh, there with his portfolio. And at the time, I wasn't even on 2000 AD. I was working for Marvel Comics UK, mm. which was about to launch a whole line of new material, which was quite innovative at the time. Mm. Up to then, it had been purely a reprint operation. <clears throat> so we were on the lookout for um, new talent through handle strips like Hulk, mm -hmm. Nick Fury of S.H.I.E.L.D., um, a couple of new ones we were doing called Night Raven, and, uh, oh, so I can't remember them all. Black Knight, that was the other one we were doing. Right. <clears throat> so, um, and I'd just come off my, well, I was still doing in a while. I was doing my, my, uh, my own fanzine at the time called, excuse me a second, <clears throat> called Comic Media News. Hmm. So I was aware of the, of the, the fan scene, as it were, and, uh, the people around and, uh, people like Dave Gibbons, Brian Bolland, Etc. And there was this sort of new wave of people coming up, and I'd heard about Steve, and um, um, I, so I just literally ran into him in, in I think, Moon Planet, and he had his portfolio with him, and I saw his work, and immediately I knew this was somebody we needed to have on board to do to do uh, to do good innovative British comics for, for for as I say, Marvel UK at the time, mm. and um, he was one of several new exciting talent that was just emerging at the time and when I saw his work I just thought this is just brilliant stuff mm. so he did some stuff for us for Marvel UK and um, 
Later, I got to do a couple of bits and pieces in my own fanzine as I was in the last issues of it. And then I ended up at uh, IPC Magazines, mm. publishers then of 2000 AD. Yeah. And after a brief spell on another title, I moved to 2000. And, um, and I just remembered Steve's work, and I just thought he would be such a natural fit for 2000 AD um, that I immediately suggested it to Steve McManus, who was then the editor. And uh, we got him on board, and that's basically it for you know, how we got Steve into British comics. In that chance encounter in Forbidden Planet, you're looking through the portfolio of, of what is essentially a, a, a schoolboy. I mean, he was, what, 16 years old at the time? Uh, I think he, 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 he didn't seem 16. <laughs> he, was, he was a very wise head on the... On the, on the Young shoulders at the time. Sure, sure. What 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 was the what were the things that, that tipped you off? What, what what was the essence of of, of the the art that you saw it's before? It's difficult you? to say. It's like one of these things. Like if you're a musician, you hear a bit of music, and mm. suddenly think that's it. And I just saw Steve's style and <clears throat> his dynamic style. He was bringing to some just brilliant character figure drawing, and um, and I, even then I wasn't sure because. I was seeing a lot of people at the time, and there are very few people that can combine really excellent draftsmanship work with the rigors of doing a comic strip. Mm. Um, there are illustrators, there are comics artists, and um, many times the two don't mix. Yeah. Fortunately, Steve was able to, without a problem, uh, do both and brought his brilliant art star to a sequential art style by laying out a page and uh, as I say it was one of these things you just feel it was right at the time and uh, I just knew yeah, again Dave and Brian and all the others already emerged at that time or were emerging and I just thought Steve was another one that should be joining that group. Mm. As, as uh, uh, I mean you were assistant editor uh, from about 1980 to to, to 1983, um, yep. when you're when you're bringing on a, a a a young fresh talent like that, who you know you'd had dealings with at, at Marvel UK, um, what uh, what. I mean, I guess you've, you've already mentioned it, the, 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 the qualities that you're looking for, somebody who's able to, to work under that kind of pressure and exactly. maintain uh, a, a style. There's, there's, there's so much about the, those early pages in, in, um, uh, on, on Nick Fury and uh, uh, in, in Hulk Weekly that you look at it and go, well, that's Steve Dillon. You know, he was his style was there from the very well, beginning. Well, at the time it was, who's this? Yeah. I want to know more. <laughs> sure. And that was that was that was that was the really exciting thing about being in comics at the time. I mean, all these people that we know so well now, like virtually household names, were just getting started at the time, mm. and their art was being introduced to a whole new audience. And it was just the reaction you got from that audience. I mean, it was just sadly there was. I, I go back to a time before computers, sadly, <laughs> and um, we used to get you know literally letters coming in a huge post bag every day mm. and the minute a new exciting new talent emerged it, it was like a sudden you know a, an extra swirl of letters that week mm. all saying wow I love this guy oh it's brilliant do more you know, put him on this put him on that you know and Steve was one of the people that got that reaction because he, he, he his uh, early work he, he did um, uh, the greatest story ever told for the 1980 uh special um yes and the work on mean arena now uh, th that's a strip that that uh i mean this is this is just my personal opinion steve's artwork really elevated that into something you know more yeah, more, we, more than we, it was exactly i mean we had he was a natural for that sort of story mm. um uh i'm afraid my memory is hazy of all the details <laughs> of all the strips that we did yeah. There was a lot of them, and a lot that you know, didn't actually even make it to the printed page. But I think we had that sort of um, on on the sort of launch pad, as it were. We needed a really strong artist for it, and I think Steve was the just the right choice at the time. Mm. We we usually introduce people. I think we had future shops then. That was a sort of real test ground for people mm. to see if they do our stories, and then. We might try them on another series, and then, of course, you know, ultimately elevate them to the main strips like Dread and that sort of thing. 
And and you, you you already mentioned that that you felt that Steve was a, a an old head on on, on a young body. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about that young Steve, that that that, that fresh. Well, new I just talent. remember a very very nice guy, a very mm. friendly guy. Uh, one of the people I, it was just a pleasure to spend time with. Mm. Uh, and in those days, there was quite a lot of um, socialising with the creators. You know, uh, out of work hours we. We, um, I can't remember the exact dates, I think maybe it was a bit later, we used to have what was called a BNO, a boys' night out, <laughs> every month in London. That would be people like Dave and Brian and Mike McMahon and a few others, you know. And mm. If he was around, he'd be yeah, coming along to one of those or we'd have drinks or something. And it was just nice to be in their company and listen to them talk and find out more about them, what drove them, what their, who their influences were, all that sort of thing. And, Steve was one of those people that was just a joy to be with. Mm. And and since he uh, ultimately you 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 were one of the people in in charge of of uh, getting the work out of him. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things that that uh, uh, I mean we've we, we've blogged about is his legendary speed, the the fact that he could turn around things so so quickly. What was your experience of him as an editor? Well, j- just that. I mean, that's probably the most valuable. Um, skill a comic artist can have is to do the work and do the work do the work well and do it on time mm. um it's, it's a double bonus if somebody can do that sometimes they have to be compromised to get the work on time don't forget you know at the end of the day horrible expression i'm sorry to use it but then we had to get a complete issue out every week mm. 30 36 pages 32 pages um, and, you know, we did not have time to really spend a lot of time nurturing people. Mm. They had to be able to almost hit the ground running. Uh, Steve was one of the people that did that. He just right from the start, you know, did the work, got it in on time. And uh, and we were able to plan things around that, you know, so mm. in the future we knew um, he would he would naturally come to mind. If there was a strip coming up, we knew we had to get it done at a certain time to a certain quality his name would come into the frame very quickly. You you spent some time away from 2000 AD uh, after 1983, but then came back in mm-hmm. 87, I believe it was, um, yep. and, and was editor through to 94. Um, yeah. Contrast Steve when you were assistant editor uh, and, and also at Marvel UK with the Steve that you encountered as editor in, in, in the late 80s. Um, well... Uh... Sadly, I didn't spend as much time in Glitter. He, he moved to Ireland around that time as well. Mm. So we didn't see a lot of him in London. Um, and also, because he became so popular and so well-known so quickly, he automatically became a target, what I call the American raiding parties that came <laughs> over at the time. Sure. Um, you know, uh, DC and Marvel um, woke up to the fact that 2008, he was tapping into this entirely rich, undiscovered vein of British comics talent that had just hadn't been e- even thought about before. Mm. And I remember I used to, I was actually one of the, the creators of the Eagle Awards. Yeah. And I remember one year doing the um, presentation of the awards at one of the conventions, and we were in an auditorium and there was you know, lots of American guests over, and I was on the stage organizing things. And I, Steve wasn't involved with this, but I remember we actually awarded, gave the award to somebody, a, new, a newish artist, and I watched them walk back to their to their seat. And I could see that people from DC like converging on them from like, two sides. <laughs> you could almost see the open checkbooks in hand, you know. <laughs> and um, it became very difficult at the time to really keep that talent. So we were always on the lookout for new talent, mm. and. Um, I can't remember everything Steve did did around then, but, you know, I think he became one of those people that became harder to use just because he had so many commitments to other other publishers. Mm, mm. So we had to sadly say, okay, right, well, we've now got to look for some more new talent. And I think that was one of the things I enjoyed doing most in my time as uh, as Slark, is nurturing another, the next sort of generation of, uh, of talent as is happening today as well. Mm, so, mm. you know, it, it, it's an ill wind, as they say. The fact that DC and Marvel, to some degree, were like sucking away British talent 
it meant we, we had room to bring up new talent and, and develop them and introduce them to the readers. Mm. Well, that, that neatly brings me on to talking about Deadline, which, of course, uh, was the comic that uh, um, Steve worked on with uh, the late Brett Ewins. <clears throat> um, ooh, ooh. And, and, and that was a title that uh, brought up a, a, quite a bit of new talent in, in, into the industry. Um, do you remember much about when Deadline began? Not really. I remember hearing about it. I remember, you know, lots of sort of talk about it, but mm. I'd, I'd never... <sighs> I can't remember much about it. I saw the first couple of issues or something, and it was it was great. I mean, it was fantastic talent that, but it it wasn't a mass market mm. publication to my mind. Yeah, and that's what I was interested in at the time. I, I wanted to. I mean, two thousand eighteen in those days was selling a hundred thousand plus a week. Yeah. Um, so you know, my my priority was to vent. Uh, my duty was uh, to the to the company was to keep those those figures. Yeah, at least at that level, if not higher. Mm. Um, and to do that, you know, we had to produce a commercial publication. There was a lot of people wanting to go off and do their own thing. You know, there was people sort of saying, well, I, I can be a creator, I can do both. I can be a, a writer and an artist, and I can, you know. And that was also the time, because of, you know, 2000 being crediting people, time when we were starting to um, offer quite, you know, deals that could have never existed before with British talent mm. where people could own rights and could and also we were doing graphic novels and so there was there was a life of for a strip or artwork after it had been um published mm. Mm. and um sometimes it was difficult because people would tend to think more about the graphic novel than they would the actual strip as it appeared in in the weekly yeah and it was always a difficult juggling act to try and persuade people no okay Graphic novel is later. That will bring you in some extra money. But for now, we need the strip for the week, so and we need it, and we need it done in this way. We need it done, you know, to be a, a, a powerful story that we can run week after week in 2018. Sure, sure. Uh, you, you mentioned a, a, a minute ago about uh, Steve being in in high demand. I mean, what's interesting looking at the 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 um, the archive of, uh, uh, of what strips he did and when. Even with deadline happening, even with him working uh, for, for the companies in the states, he's still at 2000 AD. Because you, you, I mean, you you, you have uh, you have him as one of the rotation artists on Oz, um, but then you've got you've got him all the way through to Emerald Dial, which was in the early 90s. That's right. Uh, that's true. Yeah. yeah. But other thing, because he he moved away, he wasn't around so much. Um, I kind of lost contact with him on a personal level. Mm. I mean, yes, you know, it was it was a case of um, commissioning work over the phone, and uh, so you know he was there, and he was, as you say, one of the, one of the sort of instigator, one of the main dread artists. But there was so much else going on that you know you can't remember every single detail of that of that <laughs> of that time. Sure, sure. But he was, as I say, you know, one of the the main two thousand and eight artists, and uh, I, I, I keep, you keep saying but such a talent you know yeah. that, uh, uh, it was clear to me he was going to go on to, to, to greater things yeah. and uh, um, as editor of 2000 AD I had to make sure that if he had if he did go on to those greater things there was somebody to cover to cover him when he when he moved on yeah yeah uh, one of the things I was going to ask about was um, there was uh, uh, the work he did on Harlem Heroes and also uh, Rogue Trooper um, yeah. Where he was being inked by Kev Walker was was mm. was that a, a consequence of him being in such demand that he couldn't yeah. ink his own work? Right, right. We well, didn't that encourage sense. that. So we didn't. That was that, definitely the American style of doing comics, mm. having a pencil or an inker, and it was something we that didn't happen in British comics. We much prefer to have our our artists be in total control of their work in terms of producing finished artwork. Mm. Mm. Uh, on delivery rather than uh, having to uh, you know, organise inkers and people help finish them off. So if there is or, or was at the time any any, any, um, any inking of some of this style, I, I'm trying to think if there was anybody that sort of only two people like to work together. I can't think of it right off the top of my head right now, but it definitely wasn't a standard way of doing things. Mm. Mm. Okay, okay. And uh, one of the things that that's really... Uh, been wonderful 
uh, bittersweet but wonderful um, since Steve's death is is the outpouring of stories about him and uh, the he, way he was one of those exactly he was yeah. one of those people you know who, who had a story for everything yeah. uh, and, and, and as I said he was just a, a pleasure to be around on, on a, on a on a social and personal level. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember getting to many marks with him and conventions and things at the time, you know. And like, like Alan Moore, who was, before he became Alan Moore, <laughs> um, was just a, a joy to be with at conventions because he'd be so funny and uh, and uh, do such incredible, such outrageous things. Mm -hmm. It's difficult now because like, all these people are such big names. Yeah. It's probably difficult for people to realise at one time they were they were just starting off. They were struggling, new artists or writers, mm. and um, and you know and it was a you know it was kind of a continual process of discovering these people. In those days, it was very much um, the comic conventions that were the sort of um, place where we we found a lot of new talent because we were to have people coming along with their portfolios. And we'd usually do two or three sessions where we just uh, sit behind the table and have people deliver their portfolios to us. And we'd have a look at them and and uh, say, oh, yeah, okay, well, maybe do something. Either give them a future shock or call them back later or whatever, you know. But mm. So it was an ongoing process. Yeah. One thing I, I, I wanted to kind of pick your brains as, 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 as far as you can remember is, is uh, references to an earlier question I asked about the essence of Steve's artwork because I saw Pat Mills um, in the tribute refer to uh, his ability to, to really reflect uh, noir, you know, that, that kind of monochrome black and white stark mm. style. Um, but also there was a, a, an incredible amount of storytelling that, that you get the sense wasn't in the scripts. Uh, you'd be surprised how much probably was in the scripts at some, right. at some stages, but again, there are were people, and Steve was one of them. He was able to take a script and inject a whole new level of uh, of, of, um, of dynamic action in it, mm. and and as you say, storytelling and character development. I think the black and white, the noir thing, comes out of the fact that in the early days of two thousand, we ha we only had black and white artwork. Mm. Even the dread center spreads were colored by, by um, um, uh, somebody else. They weren't actually done by the artist. And they were done, uh, they were done basically in the office. Um, mm. um, the artist would supply line work and, and we'd have a colorist actually color it in. Mm. Um, so an artist that could work well in black and white was a definite benefit, a definite plus at the time. But it was only later when we when we brought colour into two thousand and eighteen that people would start sort of, you know you know, doing different things and, and in some cases doing some quite incredible things as well. Mm. Or in the case of Simon Bisley basically producing brown wind of soup on a page. <laughs> 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 Took him a long time to get used to colour. <laughs> we get these dark brown pages coming into the office. <laughs> um but anyway, um yeah, so yeah, again, you know, it's, it's part of Steve's talent to be able to recognise in the script uh, things he can bring his own style and his own storytelling to. Mm. Um, in the, again, in the, in the early days, it was, the scripts were very tight. We you know, The scripts were delivered, and then the artist was chosen. So we didn't necessarily know who was actually drawing a particular story uh, until after the script was done. Later on, there was much more collaboration, and, and we'd actually find, try and find writers that could work well with a particular artist's style. Looking back on your time as editor of, mm -hmm. of, of 2000 AD. Long, long time ago. <laughs> um, is, is there a, a, a certain degree of pride about not just having um, brought up new talent uh, like Steve, but uh, but of having nurtured it as well? So, so that when DC and Marvel do come knocking on the door with their big checkbooks, there's there's a certain amount of of you know job well done. Uh, in pride, yes, enormous pride. Mm. I mean, it was such a fantastic time to be in comics. Um, I actually myself had more than one um, approach from DC to go and work for them. Oh really? Oh yeah. Right. Um, but circumstances and a few other factors at the time uh, meant it wasn't possible. But I've never regretted it because mm. I felt I did I could do more on a comic like 2000 AD than I could in a, a huge um, 
corporation mm. that's producing dozens of different comics. So one comic versus dozens, is, you know, to my mind, to my mind, or I always always go for the for the big fish in the small pond sort of thing. Mm. Mm. Um, so yes, um, it was just. A, I think it was, I realised at the time, and we were not only was 2000 AD, you know, sort of getting huge reaction from the readers, but we were getting so much other reaction from from uh, how do we call it the sort of uh, uh, it's probably the wrong word to use, but the showbiz side of things. Mm. We were having a lot of uh, interest from bands at the time. In Madness, were a huge, were huge fans of 2000 AD at one time. And when we had um, our 15th anniversary um, bash at the uh, Camden Palace, you know, we had Motorhead along there. Lemmy from <laughs> Motorhead was there. Yeah. And uh, we were always having TV crews in the office, uh, programs ringing up, wanting to do something on 2000 AD. So it was such it was such a buzz about the whole thing. You know, you felt you were doing something important. Mm. It, 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 I mean, it's wonderful to hear that alongside the, the kind of very personal stories, you know, that, that, that people have talked about being in the pub with Steve and, uh, you know, Tom Frame, who were both oh, uh, pool, was, pool sharks. Yeah, absolutely. Tom Tom was was probably the, one of the main colourists of the Dread uh, spreads I mentioned earlier. Mm. And he actually worked in the office. He was freelance, didn't work, he wasn't on staff, but he based himself in the office and it was such... Um, Right from was day one for me, I was sitting literally at a desk facing him, and to watch him work was such an education. I mean, I, I always felt the the letterer, uh, I always like to call them the lettering artists, because they, they, they literally did. It was as much, a, their contri- contribution to a strip was as, probably as much as the writer and, and the artist in some respect, because mm. their placement of the balloons, and how they told the story, how they made the story flow, and the words flow into each other. The words, words was not an easy thing to do at all. But to see Tom doing this day after day, and also the, his colour work on the spreads was just fantastic to see. Mm, mm, um, sadly, you know, most of the other contributors, you didn't mm. see them work. You call them up, you talk over things, they deliver roughs maybe, and they deliver finished art, and that's it. Mm. But to sit and watch somebody create something from scratch is quite an incredible thing to do. Now, we're going to be hearing from lots of other people uh, on this episode about Steve. Just just any final thoughts about him and his legacy? It's a sad occasion, clearly, mm. um, to have lost such a talent as Steve. And But it, it's, if I use the heart, word heartwarming, to see the sort of, as you said, the outpouring mm. of respect for him and, and love for him. You know, um, he was a creator that, that other creators like to be with. Yeah. And that wasn't always the case. Mm. So, um, you know, to see that is fantastic. And, and, but it doesn't mask the sadness of, of obviously not having him around anymore. Yeah, no, absolutely. And to have lost him at, that, at, at such an early age. So, but long may we remember him. Great to hear from Richard there. Somebody who knew Steve very well was uh, artist John McRae, another alumnus of uh, 2000 AD. And uh, again, great to welcome him onto the Thrillcast to uh, to talk about his memories of Steve. Welcome to the Thrillcast for the first time, John. Yeah, hello there. How are you? Hi. We're here to, to talk about Steve. Um, sure. uh, and and it, it's still very recent, very raw. Uh, but I, I wanted to get a sense from 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 you, somebody who would known him for years and you know hung out an awful lot. Well, I just wanted to get a sense from you uh, uh, about um, the Steve Dillon that you knew. Uh, well, uh, I mean, Steve, uh, when I met him, seemed like the father figure of all of us. Uh, when when I first started to know Steve, which was around tw- when I was about 22, 23, um, Steve though he was only four years older than us, hmm. in actuality, he seemed like our big uncle, <laughs> uh, big cool uncle who always knew, he always knew what was going on. And, uh, and we kind of all looked up to him. Phil Bond recently just mentioned on Twitter, how Steve was like the big cool uncle. Hmm. And it's true. I, I remember, uh, when we first met him, 
thinking that this was a guy who had been around for so long in comics. Mm. And he, I mean, I remember when I was 10 or 11, going down to my local newsagents and picking up the first issue of Hulk Weekly. Mm. And inside was a comic drawn by Steve. Steve was 16. No, yeah. I was 12. Steve was 16. And, yeah. uh, but so it always seemed like he'd been about. And he had that presence about him as well. A big guy quite gruff in certain ways, but a real softy at heart, of course. Mm. Um, but he always knew what he was talking about. Seemed like he'd been in the biz forever, and we kind of all looked up to him as a kind of, the sort of, uh, our, our mentor uh, to a degree as well. Mm. Steve always had a word of advice about your work and was always happy to share and help too. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's how I, I felt about him. I mean, when I first got to know him, he was living down in Dublin, mm. and I was in Belfast with Garth, and we would trundle down on the train to see Steve and um, it got to the point where <laughs> I remember going down myself one time uh, and I headed down into the into, down, I hadn't warned Steve that I was coming I just jumped on the train head down to Dublin jumped on the the dart out to Rohini which is where Steve lived at the time mm. and uh, got off at the dart and didn't bother going to his house I just went to the Green Dolphin which is his was his local pub walked up the stairs to the second floor, walked diagonally across the, the room to the corner booth, and there was Steve and uh, and Marie, his his wife, sitting there. And uh, yeah, he was that was his spot. And so <laughs> I knew just to walk right over. I just tapped them on the shoulder and were like, "Hey, bloody hell, what are you doing here?" So, um, so that was quite quite uh, you know, it was a very familiar thing having Steve over there at the time. You mentioned there about reading. Uh, his stuff when it was in 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 Hulk Weekly. Um, sure. What was it about his style, about his artwork that you that you liked? Well, it was very dynamic, uh, very uh, slick, um, uh, very uh, yes, really really enjoyable style. I mean, it was still quite raw at the time, but mm. to my eyes, it was uh, it was fantastic. And if you look at it now, it is so incredibly well finished. For a sixteen-year-old, um, that uh, it, it's amazing. And and uh, as time went on, <clears throat> as as you you got to know each other, and obviously you know h- hanging out with, with with Garth and things like that. Um, sure. Tell us something a, a, a bit about how Steve changed over the years, if indeed he did change at all. Because I mean, R- Richard Burton mentioned um, when he first met him, uh, you know, he was only sixteen. But there, sure. there, there was that old head on the young body, and you know, you, yeah. you know, and you, you were talking about him being like you, you know, your big brother or you, you know, the, the the older uncle kind of kind of figure. Yes. Um, how, how how did that help? Well, I mean, help as time you, went you know? on. He became, uh, it was more that it, Steve didn't change. It was I changed, <laughs> <laughs> and the people around him. We got a bit older, and instead of being quite so awestruck, mm. which I always, you know, how you would meet Steve. And, I, and I've done this with most people I've met in my time who have admired greatly. I've failed on a few occasions, but it's to just treat them like a person hmm. and just be not a fan, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and just say, and just talk to them like a human being. Hmm. And then you become friends with them. Uh, so what, what, I mean, slowly, and every time I met Steve when I was young and first got to know him, internally I was going, Steve. Dylan, he drew the white wolf Jack Strahd story, my favourite dread story, <laughs> you know. And outwardly, I was going another pint, Steve, and uh, and and that was the way. But after a while, of course, you just became his friend. Yeah, and it was, and so it was myself who changed. Steve never changed. Mm. Um, he was always <laughs> exactly the same. Little little um, packet of Rizzlers. The, the tobacco, rolling tobacco, pint of Guinness in a bar. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's, Steve was always that. That yeah. was the thing. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that's, so no, no, Steve didn't really ever change. It was more us, us around him who changed and maybe grew up a little bit. Yeah. Certainly, um, I remember when the Deadline crew were doing a big tour and we all ended up back at Steve's place, um, after signing at Dublin and, um, there was Nick Abadzis, Jamie Hewlett, Phil Bonds, myself, and a few others who I uh, I should remember but can't off the top of my head. Mm. Um, we we all tore around like kids, 
you know, and we were all bit pissed and, uh, you know, high on whatever in life, that is. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, we were running around doing stupid things. I remember picking Phil Bond up and throwing him over my shoulders and running across a road, a very busy road with Phil screaming as I, as I ran out across the road. And Steve just sitting there going, oh, kids, <laughs> type thing. <laughs> you know? so, so, yeah, yeah, it was really more of us growing up. Right. You know? Well, there's, there's, there's been wonderful uh, photographs shared on on Facebook of, of uh, various moments in, in, in Steve's life. And uh, sure. one, one that was particularly nice was um, Garth's uh, stag do. Sure, in, 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 Rath- in Rathlin Island, uh, just off sure. the coast of Northern Ireland. And, uh-huh. you know, you've, you've, uh, you're there. Sure. Um, you know, Glenn Faber is there, uh, obviously Gar- Garth and, 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 and Steve. And yeah, it, Liam Sharp. Uh, Liam Sharp, of course. And Warren Ellis. It, it, um, it's, it's just that, that sense of this. Derek Robertson. Uh, <laughs> Derek would kill me if I didn't mention Derek. <laughs> but it's that sense of, of the, uh, you weren't just all, um, you know, I don't know, colleagues uh, in, in, in comic art. You were all friends, and Steve always seemed to be at the centre of that. Well, absolutely. I mean, Steve was the big lynch, linchpin. I mean, again, if you look at that those pictures, I mean, Steve and Glenn were about the same age, mm. I guess, or about the same age. In fact, Steve, I think Glenn's maybe was a year younger. He's a year younger. I, I can't quite... I mean, I, I'm 50. Glenn... I remember Glenn ringing me up the day before he turned 50, and that was a couple of years ago. <laughs> so, and Steve's 50, Steve was, is 54. Mm. So, um, but again, Steve always seemed like the big sensible one. <laughs> and even when he was messing about and fooling around, playing, having a drink, telling jokes, he was still the big sensible one. So it's, it seems. And if you look at that particular photo, he sort of stand that one where he's standing with the pool cue beside the pool table. Yeah. Um, he's kind of the center of attention. He's obviously in the middle of telling a joke, but, and we're all sort of sitting there looking up to Steve and uh, hanging on his every word. <laughs> so yeah, I know, I know that very photo and I remember that very evening, or at least I remember bits of it. So yeah, <laughs> it was a, it was a fun evening, but, um, yeah, Steve was, um, Steve was that, that, that's the thing. We were all, by that point, uh, obviously very good friends. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think there's a shared sort of sensibility uh, when you come through from British comics, especially. I think, uh, you know, in the type of British comics, you know, 2000 AD action, stuff like that battle that we all grew up reading mm. um, to some degree or another, though I know Steve was more of a superhero guy, and admittedly I was too, but I read 2080 from issue one, I read Action, I read Battle as well, and loved all that stuff, and everybody who would read that sort of stuff and want to do that as for a living has obviously got to have some sort of shared sensibility, be it ever so slightly warped, I presume. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. But yeah, yeah, Steve, that was a that was a very fine evening in Rathlin. So mm-hmm. it was. Um, was there a memory that that sprang to mind um, when uh, uh, you know the the, the, sh- the shock had begun to to settle in? Was was there was there a happy bittersweet memory that that popped well, into uh, mind? Well, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and if you look on my Twitter feed, it's it's the it's the pinned tweet on mine was that <laughs> photograph of me and Steve with the bunny rabbits. Oh. And I and you know I put that up because well that sits in Garth's fridge as well, and it's a, <laughs> it's kind of a it's a funny picture because of course of the sort of stuff that Steve and I do and draw a lot of the time and are very much associated with. To see the two of us sort of sitting there with back to back with our bunny rabbits in our hands is kind of um, ironic. And yes, that's um that that's the that that evening was particularly good fun, fun evening. You know, we were just having a laugh back at Garth's place. They're Garth's bunny rabbits. <laughs> and um <laughs> for anybody who's wondering. Uh, and yeah, we just did. Uh, and that, that night, uh, particularly down at the pub and then going back to Garth's, was just a very, a very enjoyable evening. And uh, that one sort of sticks in my head quite a lot. Yeah. So it does. But generally, you know, Steve, just the other thing that I always found about Steve and Garth, I suppose, was them, because they were the kind of the, the team, um, was any time I went to the pub with them trying to actually drink like they drank 
which was always a fatal mistake for me. Um, I would sit down and they would o- we'd order a round and I'd drink my first pint of Guinness and I'd finish it at the same time as them. And then they'd order another round and they'd be finishing their second pint of Guinness and I'd be struggling halfway through my second pint. And they'd order a third pint and I'd just continue struggling with the second pint. And yet by the time Steve got to his 10th pint, he was still absolutely sort of steady as a, a rock mm. and didn't seem particularly phased by it, obviously. Over time, it's taken its toll, but um, you know. But uh, I just remember how how well he handled his drink <laughs> as well, and just uh, laughed through it while I slid slowly under the seat. Um, yes, so, but uh, I that was Steve, all right. And I guess what the other thing is is that the other thing, and I, I probably not even. Oh, maybe I have mentioned it. Just how much I admired his work. Of course, mm-hmm. I mean, I I tended to forget. Because when, when I get together with Garth and, and did with Steve, we very rarely talked too much about business. Mm. It was, um, and I, I very rarely ever told Steve how much I admired and, and appreciated his work. So, you know, that's, um, that's one of the note I think I would like to end on is that just how much a big a fan I was of his work mm. and how, how brilliant and natural an artist he was. And his dread is somebody mentioned that it was a sort of a the way you imagine dread to be. Yeah. That was a Twitter that I retweeted, and um, and it, and it's sort of true actually when you kind of think of dread. That sort of the the way Steve draw, draws him comes out. Even though possibly my my favourite dread is something like McMahon's dread, mm. but Steve's is kind of an iconic, I suppose. And he and he just uh, he was just a, a very natural artist, and uh, and I think that shone through in his work. And it's a it's a great shock and loss for the comics community because he really was in the last couple of years starting to find his you know his his drawing feet again. If you look at the Scarlet Witch work he was doing, there was some tremendous drawing going on in there. Um, you know, I, and I, I know that some people accuse Steve of drawing by the numbers, and at, and at certain points in his career, I think he he did a little, but. Uh, you know, with that natural talent, he was never bad. Mm. He was always <laughs> solid. But when he really tried, and he was trying again with Scarlet Witch, and I suppose on the Punisher, I haven't seen any of his Punisher work yet. But uh, the new stuff with Becky Keenan, but mm. um, but the Scarlet Witch stuff was tremendous. I thought, and it was just like a return to form for him. Mm. So it's a it's a real shame, a real shock, and you know, the com- comics community is really a, a sort of sadder and smaller place without him. As John has just explained, there's no shortage of uh, friends of Steve who have uh, warm and uh, heartwarming stories about uh, knowing him. Somebody else who knows Steve from his 2080 days is uh, John Higgins, uh, another 2080 artist of uh, no small renown, and it's uh, great to welcome him to the Thrillcast. Welcome, John. Hi, Mike. Um, t- tell me a bit about the Steve Dillon that you knew. Um the great thing about Steve, I mean, everyone, the great thing about the last, uh, sad as it is, the last couple of weeks, are like, you know, so many people remembered Steve in different ways, you know, it's like so, so many different facets. I knew Steve from when, you know, uh, he basically first started. He'd probably been doing it about two years before I met him. Hmm. And we met around 1979, and we basically just became friends from that point onwards. I mean, and he never changed over the years. He was always the same. You could approach him and you felt you were going to become, uh, you know, a good drinking buddy. And, um, you know, it's certainly in my case that, 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 that was the thing, you know, we, like, we started, uh, freelancing around the same time. Uh, but he was a fully fledged, you know, he seemed to appear out of nowhere as a, you know, just stunning comic artist. And I was just trying to get break into the business. Um, so for me, knowing Steve, probably more as a drinking um, buddy in the early days as opposed to like a fellow professional because I was trying to become a professional comic artist and he already was. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he, he was just sort of like um, uh, like a bolt out of the blue of his ability and his talent and his just natural ability. So, yeah, the early days were just like we were all hanging around the same areas, you know, Westminster Comic Mart, which you must have, been heard about quite a number of times in the past because yeah. everyone who was around 
in the early 80s, you know, used to go there. So like, and, uh, you know, me and Steve and Alan Moore and a couple of other people, Dave Gibbons was there, obviously, mm. with Alan. And um, so just drinking with them in the early days is one of the things that I remember more than anything. And that was obviously about five, ten years before we actually moved in together. Actually, it's probably about 15 years before we moved in together, mm. which was in Luton and Courtney House. So, yeah, in the early days, it was just a case of um, hanging around, trying to, like, you know, get the sense of how good an artist Steve was and through osmosis, usually through liquid and juiced Guinness drinking osmosis, I would get some of that into me, you know, and, uh, you know, it. I don't think it worked, but um, I certainly <laughs> learned from him, that's for sure. So t- tell us a little bit about uh, living in Courtney House. The, I, I moved to Loon, which is um, Steve's hometown, in probably the mid 80s and so like steve had left and he was living in london he was i i think you know he probably lived with uh, tom frame for a while and Mm. he was living in a number of different places um in london um but luton was steve's hometown i used to meet him a couple of times when he came back to see his family you know i used to meet him for a beer and stuff like that then he married marie and so he moved to dublin Mm. um in ireland and so we didn't really see him for a couple of years outside the conventions and then, so like living in Luton, so like you know, home studios tend to get a bit um, stifling after a while. I mean, you, you know, particularly once you become busy, so like it's just easy to trundle from your bed to the drawing board, trundle from the drawing board down to some food, and then trundle back to bed. And <laughs> you know, do that seven days a week. And when you got busy, it got really, you know, drove you mad. So I need to find um, a studio close enough to be, you know feasible to get into without like commuting because i hate commuting that's one of the things that uh, you'll find most freelancers appreciate most about being freelancers you know it's your choice whether or not you commute or not mm. um so, so like courtney house was only you know initially in the early days was walking distance and then I'm, when i moved out to a village on the in bedfordshire it was a cycling distance and it was dead easy to get into so it's in the um, high town area of Luton, which uh, thankfully did turn out to be very close to the, the best pub in uh, Luton, which was the Brickies. Um, and Steve moved in. I probably moved in in the early 90s, and then Steve had come back from Dublin, and him and Marie was like had moved in back into um, into the Luton area. And I think uh, Steve was like, so he had the same feeling, you know, he was working at home, working nonstop. I think he might have just started working on Preachy around that time in the mid-90s. Mm. Um, so he needed to get away and sort of like, you know, become more sort of like, um, he was never 9 to 5, but, you know, you need to have some sort of base where you could sort of like either work around the clock, which he did, you know, because of his kids were growing up, going to school. So he moved into a studio just opposite me, in uh, on the second floor on Courtney House, which um, was just great fun. I mean, in the early days, you know, it was me against all these cynical, hard bitten designers and illustrators who, you know, talked about money. They could quantify sort of like the, um, you know, their hourly rate. I mean, for me, and Steve was a page rate, and, you know, you they, this is what you were given, mm-hmm. and that's what you accepted. So it was great to have Steve around, and, um, yeah, we just sort of like enjoyed uh, the fact that we were working together. We could speak the same language. You know, no one else knew what on earth, you know, half the stuff we were doing. And it took us a while to educate them. So, you know, the early days in Corny House, um, it was me and Steve against the cynical designers and illustrators there at the time. One of the things that uh, we, we've chatted about uh, previously, uh, and, and I did a blog post for the 2018 um website was about the 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 famous uh, incident of the missing artwork from city of the damned where uh, steve had to uh, hurriedly uh, spend a weekend redrawing an episode after it had gone missing only for it to uh, have been in his folder um that had been left in the pub uh on on the uh, on the, the previous day um yeah. which is you know it's a, a wonderful story what were some of the stories that uh, that stand out for you in your time of knowing steve well the great thing about steve and and everyone sort of like knew how fast he was and he really was one of the fastest um 
pencilers and ink, and, well, certainly pencilers. Mm. Um, probably the story that's like, there's so many stories, there really is. I mean, it, it, it's sort of like, he was a phenomenal talent in a way that people, I've never seen anyone else be so naturally gifted mm. as a, a storytelling artist. Um, he could start at the top left-hand side of a page and literally just start there and just go all the way down the page and finish on the bottom right-hand page. And it would be almost a perfectly laid out page of storytelling with very little changing. I've never seen him rub out right. ever. Um, Jimmy Palmiotti, the great thing about Courtney House was like after a while, it's like it, it was a place where people used to come to to visit me and Steve, you know, it's like lots of the British creators, Simon Firm and um, David Lloyd, you know, uh, Martin Griffiths and, you know, many others, Andy Lanning and so on, used to come to Courtney House because we were all starting to collaborate on different things. And because Steve was doing loads of stuff for America, we started getting the Americans coming over again. Obviously, Garth Ennis was coming. Matt Hollingsworth, who worked with him on Coldestone Preacher, he was there as well. Every now and then, they were obviously a lot less often, usually was related to UCAC, which um, is an old comic convention that was happening in the mid-90s for quite a while. Um, so they used to pop along every time they were in town over this side of the uh, the pond mm. and um, Jimmy Palmiotti, so like this is towards the end of the preacher um, Ron, he was just finishing off preacher and he just started on Punisher and you know it was completely mad I remember talking to him in the pub about it and he said you, you really should not take on two monthly books <laughs> it was just madness you know two 22 page monthly books but Steve decided to do it and they actually could do it but Jimmy Palmiotti took over the inking on um, Punisher mm. Uh, because it really was physically impossible for anyone, even someone like Steve, to pencil and ink two books, mm. two monthly books, and to keep that integrity of um, storytelling that Steve kept all the way through to the end of um, Preacher. Mm. And Jimmy Palmiotti came over and he spent a couple of weeks inking one of the issues of um, Punisher with Steve. And Steve was penciling pages and finishing the pencils faster than Jimmy Palmiotti could ink them and <laughs> no one can pencil that fast mm. to that standard that i know of you know steve kind of could do it so it's just really fun to see an inker actually not being able to get ahead of the pencil the first time ever in certainly my experience so that was a really nice uh to see something like that mm. the thing is with like you know the, the the daily grind of sort of like producing a monthly book um you know for how many years i think it was five years the preacher went on for it really is, um, it can be quite, it, it's a grind, no matter how much you love the job, no matter how good you are at it, it is a grind. And Steve used to get to the stage where, you know, he would, the, the script would come in from Garth, edited from Axel Alonso, who was his editor on um, Preacher, and he would start looking at it and then he'd start producing the pages. But the thing is, after a while, what tends to happen was the fact that because the schedule was so killing, mm. which is obviously probably the reason why they're called deadlines, <laughs> he just used to burn himself out. You know, he, he literally used to come into the studios and sort of like, you know, work five days solidly, day and night, mm. basically living in the studios, like going to the uh, the brickies to get sustenance, walking around past um, Sammy's kebabs to get something to eat and then come in and literally work as many hours as he could stay awake. And literally burn himself out for a week or two weeks just because you just had to recover from that sort of um, stress and pressure. Mm. And by the time he'd sorted himself out and got back to his um, fighting uh, fitness, or shall we say, drawing fighting fitness, he'd have to go through the same, same process all over again. So it's a real roller coaster, so like, you know, you know, day and night, like non stop five days, if that. Mm like working non-stop in the <coughs> studios and then so like spending two, three weeks recovering, you know. And we, none of us could so like talk him out of approaching it that way, you know. It's just the way, it's the only way he could do it, you know. He had to have that like hell of a deadline mm. hanging over his neck before he could actually sit down and start producing the incredible stories that he was producing for Preacher. When people talk about uh, 2008 and specifically Judge Dredd, they always have their favourites. 
but the the the, the favorite artists are there's always a, a list i find you know people say well this one's my favorite but also i like this 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 and this um what 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 place do you think steve made for himself with his work on 2080 where does he sit in the the, the pantheon of creators who've worked on on dread I think what Steve had probably started, uh, he was getting to a stage, I think it was the uh, the mid, um, mid-80s mid who was doing more stuff in 2000, maybe, was it? I mean, it's like by that stage, he's been, he'd been a working professional for about seven, eight years, maybe even longer. Mm. And so, like, so he knew exactly what he was doing. And I think for me, it's like he could set a scene in a way that no one else could. He made sort of like um, the Mega City one look dirty and industrial. I mean, I don't think anyone else had done that. I mean, mm. as wonderful as Mick McMahon was, um, he sort of mixed stuff was very sort of like blocky and sort of like created the template for the world of Cam Kennedy probably in some ways had a similar um, way of doing the street furniture, should we say, of um, mm. the Mega City one. And there was like a really great sense of urban, um, uh, I know, you just felt this was a dirty, mean street sort of thing when Steve Dillon did it, you know. Mm. And I got that impression very, very early on. He had such a sense of dimensionality, you know. You, you could, it's almost, you feel once you walk through that corridor and down, turn left, Steve would, he was directing you exactly where you were going in, mm. in this world, in this universe. And I don't think anyone else, in my opinion, has done better than Steve. Um, I think the, um, I can't remember the name of the, the Soviet agent. I can't remember what one that's called. I hope you got that with your fingertips. Uh, Orlock. Orlock, yeah. I mean, that for me was when they were in the, uh, the watering plant or the water plant. Yeah. And it was just like, um, stunning. He'd set it in such a place. He, he dropped back. He could be pulled well back from the characters and set the scene so well. And, you know, the league table is impossible to like, you know, say, you know, who's number one, who's number two, who's number 10. And as you say, it's like all the fans and the readers have different people that they like and different stories. Mm. And it really is a mix of story and writer and the combination of the elements and the characters, the individual characters appear around Dread that will give you your favorite story. But for me, I think Steve is definitely number one, just like putting you in a place that you feel this is a scary and very real future world. You know, mm. he, he was probably one of the best people that I've ever seen of just like saying this is this is real, this is a real mega city one. You know, everyone else like could stylize it and, and do incredible mega city one and it's like, you know, the furniture of the world. But you know, Steve was the one who actually made you feel this gritty, dirty world. So I'd reckon when for scene setting I would I'd definitely rate um, Steve as number one. Mm-hmm. I think some of the later artists sort of come since and obviously are building on what the, you know, the, the classic sort of like five or six arts, you know, Brian Boyle and Dave Gibbons, Steve Dillon. And, you know, it's like uh, Mick McMahon, you know, the people who come now, they've been given such a, um, a landscape to work. And, you know, I think some, some of the later artists now are actually still are getting to the stage of creating a world that's completely and utterly dimensional and believable but uh, for me steve was the one who created that sense of a place so yes yeah, steve number one on that that's for sure steve's influence uh, on 2000 ad was not restricted just to when he was working on it it was also on the way that he uh, brought up all this new talent over the years somebody who was uh, influenced, inspired, uh, and uh, friends with steve was rufus daglow who uh, is uh, working for 2080 at the moment and uh, it's great to welcome him onto the Thrillcast. Welcome Rufus. Hi Michael, it's nice to be here. Good, good. It's great to have you on. Um, but obviously uh, in very sad circumstances. Um, tell me a bit about how, how you knew Steve because you knew Steve from a from a very young age, didn't you? Yeah, I, I was very lucky. Um, you know, I, I was taken to some of the early UCAC shows when, when I was a child and I, I met um, Steve and, and Brett there, and uh, Steve Steve was very very generous chap who would stop and talk to everybody. And uh, he, I, I had an, an Absalom Absalom DAC book with me, and uh, he signed it for me. And uh, I, I was so sort of taken with this, uh, I, I started sort of uh, writing to him and uh, to Brett, 
and uh, and and they both very kindly answered back. So uh, from then on, I, I kind of knew him. And and when about was was this? Was this sort of in the in the sort of late eighties, early nineties? Uh, oh God, this 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 would have been a uh, mid eighties. So I kind of met him when I was a little kid, and then years kind of later, we reconnected because uh, I was living in Camden Town, and uh, Tom Frame lived in uh, uh, Kentish Town, just up the road. Uh, and Robin Smith, who was the art director, also used to live around there. Mm. And uh, Steve pretty much lived in Tom Frame's living room. And so they, they would work together up at the Assembly House, which was a, it, well, still is a pub, mm. uh, just opposite uh, the Forum venue, which used to be called the Town and Country Club. And uh, they would sit in there together over their pints of Guinness. And uh, Steve would do his artwork and hand it to Tom, and Tom would letter it And while they're reading Fish and Chips, which is why often, if you look at the original artwork, there's still greasy, grubby stains all over them. <laughs> well, um, we've uh, we've we've talked to John Higgins about uh, the uh, the incident of the lost artwork um, that uh, that involved a pub pub crawl that began at the uh, Assembly House. Um, <laughs> tell us a bit about uh, how Steve uh, was with people and, and and with you as a, as you know as a as, as a young upcoming artist. Uh, what 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 was he like? Was he full of uh, encouragement and, and sage advice. Uh, he he was he was he was he was fairly uh, limited with his advice, but he was just one of those people who uh, he he had he had time for everyone, so he made you feel like you were his pal, uh, mm. and w- w- which was a really very generous thing, you know, when you're when you're trying to start out and, and you're looking up to these people. And I, I think more than anything else, I think Steve sort of very much engendered a feeling in everyone that he was he was their big brother. Uh, you know, I I think because for a long time he was always the youngest of the 2000 AD kind of. Uh, group of artists and you know because he'd been there from quite early on really mm. and and when, when when he joined he was he was the kid and he was the little brother and all of a sudden he was the big professional even though he wasn't a hell of a lot older than you know uh, a lot of the artists who came much much later on mm. but you know he'd been there for you know 10 or 15 years in, in in some cases and for us he was just this you know living legend and you know he, he was he was just so generous i mean as an example uh in the, in the 90s when we still used to have the the troopers drink ups uh i brought my son along who at, at the time was about four years old and who was massively into doctor who mm-hmm. and uh you know i introduced steve was there of course sitting outside uh having a fag and a cigarette with andy diggle and uh i introduced him to steve and and explained to finn my son that you know this was the guy who used to draw you know uh daleks and uh, my son, my son, obviously being very impressed by this, asked him to draw one. So he, uh, so Steve pulled out a, little, a scrap of paper and ripped off a, a little bit and drew him a little Dalek. And Finn looked at it rather unimpressed. And, and uh, but bearing in mind that Steve had probably been drinking since mid afternoon and <laughs> drew a fairly impressive little Dalek. Um, my, my son kind of sat there and went, "I'll show you how to do it properly." And, and sat down on on Steve's knee and uh, and drew him a Dalek. And, and Steve thanked him very much and, and asked him to sign it for him. And Steve tucked it in his pocket and and, and took it away. And it, and it just really showed, you know, like Steve, no matter who he was talking to, even a four-year-old, he, he made them feel like they were special. And, uh, and and he really kind of made them feel like they were they were part of the group and part of the conversation. And I, I watched it so many times where people approached Steve very nervously. And within about two seconds, you would have thought that they'd been pals for 15 years. Mm. And, uh, you know, he was he was a very, very warm person. And... Uh... As somebody who who uh, you know, has has a, a large collection of, of original artwork from from uh, the, the, the history of two thousand AD, um, what is it about Steve's style that appeals to you? I, I think the wonderful thing about Steve is he was such an effortless storyteller. Uh, his stuff is deceptively simple. Uh, he he was very much a fan of um, Alex Toth's work, uh, the, the American artist uh, who who used very very large areas of black and. Uh, it, it's also like the Italian artist Gino D'Antonio. Uh, his his work has has a real solid simplicity to it. And actually, as an artist trying to do stuff like that, it's very very hard because there's nothing to hide behind. If you don't get it right, it looks dreadful. It's very very easy to camouflage your artwork with lots and lots of lines, like which is what I do because uh, it's you know it makes things look pretty. But um, his his work it was just absolutely pure simplicity and i think it was one of the reasons why he was so attractive uh you know for the american companies and you know for for dc in particular when 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 he first made that transition over to the states was he was such a solid storyteller he he fit right into their tradition of of comics and uh 
and he did. He, he succeeded so well. And and certainly, like uh, his first project o- over there uh, was Screamer with Brett Ewens. And Brett was so proud of this project. Uh, he kept every page of it, and he had it in his house. And just about every time I, I came over to his house, he'd always pull out all of the original artwork to Screamer, and he'd go, "I mean, Steve did this." You know, he was he was so immensely proud of it. And I think it's just a testament to his storytelling that even you know his fellow professionals and his best friends you know held him in such high regard. When uh, he and Brett started Deadline Magazine, um, there was so much new talent that came up. Uh, with that and, and and you know new generation of of, of comic book creators um was that part of steve's ethos you know he, he had been the 16 year old who bumps into an editor when he's got his portfolio under his arm uh and and had gone on to to, to amazing things was was uh supporting new talent and, and and young creators really something that he he felt strongly about i i think both steve and brett um felt uh, in a very lucky position to be able to help other people out. They also desperately like drinking with people. So <laughs> if you if you went to the pub with them and bought them a few pints, chances are they might just let you do something. Uh, so it, it was it was very it was a very open ended and 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 sometimes disastrous <laughs> uh, process of, uh, of 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 selecting people. You know, sometimes it worked fantastically. You know, they. they they found some of the you know the world's best artists that way you know you know they had you know people like Disraeli and obviously Jamie Hewlett and Philip Bond. Um, they also had some stuff in in Deadline and you really wondered what the hell it was doing there. But uh, often it was just down to the fact that someone had been drinking with them and uh, you know they when 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 they did go out for a drink it could it could go on for days. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know they they were a, a prodigious uh, a party crew of people and uh, certainly like some of the parties uh, up at like the Glasgow Comic Cons and stuff were, are still legendary now even like 25 years later well we we were hearing uh, about one or two of those from uh, from John McRae earlier um coming back to Steve style one thing that's really uh, uh struck me as I've been because I've been tweeting uh, images of of his artwork for 2000 AD a couple of days um last week um was the sense of space that even when it was uh, in, outside in Mega City One, and you've got these great big uh, city blocks, and the sky will be empty, well, virtually empty. Maybe there might be like a hover craft or something like that uh, hanging around. But even though there was no detail, somehow his style, the, the simplicity of his style, managed to create this feeling of open air, of open space. And he, I, I, I personally have always thought of him as a master of backgrounds because they were, as you say, deceptively simple. But what work he put into them created a real, you know, utilitarian sense of of uh, the world around the characters. Absolutely. I mean, uh, some of the stuff you've been sharing has been fantastic. I, I've been I've been having a, a, a apart from a, a tear in the eye, just just absolutely goggling at some of the artwork you've been sharing because I. It's easy to forget how great it is, and uh, particularly like on, on a lot of the Dread stories that he did, uh, he really took advantage of the double page splashes uh, that you know always used to be the the centerfold of 2000 AD, which is I, I'd like to point out something that should be brought back post haste. Um, and uh, he, he he really managed to to, to you know him and, and people like Mick uh, and Brendan McCarthy were real masters of that. You know they they could. Uh, create a panorama um, out of the cities uh, and or out of whatever background they, they were doing, you know, whether it was in a, a jungle, a desert, uh, the middle of Mega City One, you, they created an environment that you didn't question for a second. You looked at it and you were there. And th- th- this this was his genius. You know, he he created worlds that uh, that we believed in. And looking back over his original artwork now, it's, uh, I, I feel so privileged to, to have been able to sit and watch him draw. And, uh, you know, watch him sketch things out, or and and he was always so humble about it. You know, he to him it was his it was his job, it was his work. You know, the, the thing that he loved most was going and having a drink with his pals more than anything else. So he he worked very very quick. He worked very very hard and very very quickly. Um, so that basically he he could go and be a sociable person. Mm-hmm. And and so many of the people that knew him, especially around Luton, where where he's from and where he lived. Many of them didn't even realize that he was well known, let alone famous, uh, or that he was a, a world class and world famous artist. You know, they they just knew him as Steve, the guy who was very funny chap to know down the pub. Mm. Well, it's, it's been interesting to see a couple of the tributes from from people that he he, he knew in Luton who knew him as a new bloke, 
at, at his local because, <laughs> you know, as far as they were concerned, he was just a bloke that they drank with. And, and it, it's been wonderful to to see that now they recognise just how loved he was uh, <laughs> outside of Luton. Absolutely. Like, like I said, you know, Steve had this effect everywhere he went, you know, uh, you know, for years later, after after he he left the uh, Kentish Town area, you know, I if I went into uh, the Assembly House, uh, if there were serving staff there that recognised us, they'd always ask where he was mm. um, because he was he was he was a very good tipper, and he would he would always pay people to keep the bar open. So you know, uh, if he wanted to play pool, you know, he'd slip him a tenner and say, you know, just you know, stick around for half an hour, you know, mm. and and it was yeah, it was always fun. You know, he he always managed to make everything into a into a party uh, with, without it getting so massively out of control that, you know, you ended up in hospital. But, uh, <laughs> you know, he was, he, was, he was a very good guy to have around because uh, he, he just managed to make any social situation, uh, you know, 110% better just by him standing there. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I will always miss that. What do you think, as somebody who doesn't do his work in comics but loves comics, collects comics, collects original artwork, what, how would you sum up Steve's impact on... The industry. I, I think Steve is someone who not only just made a name for himself, but he he really uh, he, he brought home. I think as as a, a kind of second wave of the the British invasion uh, to the United States, and I, I think his legacy will, will be that he has created such beautiful stories that you know people will keep reading, and and the fact that you know his work has now been made into television television series. And I'm sure in time, a lot of other you know things that he's worked on will actually find their way probably onto the big screen. Uh, I, I have no doubt that he, he will go down as, as one of the absolute greats in comics. Uh, you know, it, it's been a really tough year for comics. You know, obviously we lost Darwin Cook uh, as well, and they're very similar artists in that they're very solid storytellers, really quite old-fashioned kind of guys, and that you know they were these kind of like both quite swashbuckling sort of. Uh, pub crawling guys who that you know the, the the sort of artists that most artists dream of being and uh they, they were just so much larger than life and i i i think that's what we need in comics is that we need more larger than life people like steve now in all of the tributes to steve over the last week or so that we've seen the one piece of work that stands out more than any other is preacher the series he co-created with garth ennis um which uh, has been turned into a, a very well received tv show and it's wonderful to have uh, Garth back on the Thrillcast to uh, to talk about Steve, who uh, was one of um, his very closest friends. Welcome back to the Thrillcast, Garth. Uh, thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. No worries. No worries. Um, obviously, you know, we, we, we've been talking to people on this episode uh, about Steve. Everyone's still in a little bit of shock. Um Let's let's go back to the beginning and your first experience of of, of, of meeting Steve. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, that, uh, that was of course in a pub. <laughs> uh, that would have been um, that would have been the Prince Albert in Brixton in July of eighty nine. I figured out recently. Wow. Um, it was uh, it was not long before he moved to Ireland. Actually, he, he moved to Dublin right yeah. after that for about five years. Um, so with him in Dublin and me in Belfast, uh, we began seeing quite a bit of each other. Mm. Um, and it would have been, I suppose it would have been not long after that we began working together. Um, first on Dread and then Hellblazer. Right, right. And, and and how I mean how did that work on 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 dread come about? Was it something that that you both said, well, we want to work together on something, or was it an editorial suggestion? Or um, I think it just happened to be what came along first. He he was back on dread after a bit of an absence. I think he came back right after Necropolis. Mm. Um, I think by that point he'd scaled back his commitment to Deadline. And he was doing work for DC, but he wanted to do Dread as well. Um, and it was around about the time that I had uh, really taken on scripting duties on Dread when, when John Wagner stepped down for mm-hmm. a bit. Um, we'd become friends really before we began working together. And we had talked quite a bit about the kinds of things we wanted to do. Um 
I can recall actually uh, one night in the summer of 1990, the two of us sitting up till dawn with a bottle of whiskey and having quite an in-depth talk uh, about what we thought we wanted to do with comics. I mean, at, at this point, of course, I've only been going about a year mm. and he has a good 10 or 12 years in the business under his belt. Um, but with everything that's been happening at that point, um, you've had Watchmen, you've had Dark Knight, uh, you've had that sort of 80s breakthrough into the mainstream, you've had Deadline, Crisis, uh, Vertigo's not come along yet, but the seeds are very definitely sown. Mm. Um, I can recall us talking about about what we wanted to do. This was in general terms, it wasn't specific stories yet. Yeah. But we saw that we wanted to work together. We saw that we had similar ideas about what, what could be done with comics. And then after that, it was just a, a matter of waiting to see what came along first. Just so happened it was dread. Right, right. Okay. And, and of course, the, 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 the big story you did together on dread was, uh, Emerald Isle, which, uh, was, was a, right. a, 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 a kind of, yeah, a wonderful parody of, of attitudes towards Ireland and stereotypes mm -hmm. ab about Ireland. Um, was, mm -hmm. was, was this, uh, was this kind of a, a maybe a, I don't know, a joke that got out of hand or, uh, you know, something you both wanted to, <laughs> to do? I think it was, it, it was really just the obvious thing to do. It was only really the second uh, dread story I'd written, right. I think. Right. Um, and with him in Dublin, uh, and, and me in Belfast, and seeing so much of each other in Ireland, it just seemed like the obvious thing to do. Mm. Uh, beyond that, I don't have a great deal of recollection of the thing Genesis, um, but I, I, do recall that when he did that uh, cover, which I see reprinted a lot, mm. actually with Dread and the Irish Judge back to back, that kind of set the tone for the thing. Mm. Um, beyond that, I'm afraid I can't tell you a great <laughs> deal about it. No worries, no worries. Well, it, it, it was kind of... Uh, Typical of Steve that um, even just that one cover, there's there's so much uh, that that you can read into that cover. You know, there's mm -hmm. the, just just the, the slight smile on Judge Joyce's face, um, the grim determination, almost annoyance of of dread, and that, that, that I think that was something yeah. that, that that he brought uh, to to preachers the, the the series that you you co created together. Um, mm. That that kind of yeah emotional intelligence to the characters that sometimes you don't necessarily get in comics. I think so. I think so. I mean, you're right. That cover really did say it all. Mm. It was his ability with character uh, to say so much with what looked like so little that. Um, that, that was really one of the secrets of Steve's success and therefore the secret of our success together. Um, if you look at Preacher, it's his ability to keep the characters constant mm. and to keep the world of Preacher constant and logical um, rather than perhaps letting things get out of control or run away with themselves that allows the story to work. Um, there is, after all, a lot of very strange stuff in, in that story in the 66 plus issues yeah. uh, that we did. Um, and if, if I had done that with a team of artists or another artist, uh, I very much doubt it would have worked. I think that's one of the things I have to say I really do owe to Steve. It, it was his ability to, to process all that lunacy. Mm and make it work and keep it constant that allowed us to do our five or six years or whatever it was without, without getting chopped. <laughs> and, and how much was, um, your work together when it was on dread or, or on preacher? Um, how much was that, uh, to a degree kind of trusting each other to, to know what the other is thinking kind of thing, you know, where, where after a while you just develop an ability to, to, uh, share, share a mind on something. Well, yes, that, that was what, that was exactly it. We mm. referred to it as our telepathy. And 
in a way, we hit the ground running on that. Um, now, I wasn't producing particularly good scripts at first, but it was Hellblazer, I think, where we really kind of honed our partnership there. He did a couple of fill-ins during my run, but he happened to come on board as a regular artist um, about halfway through the run when completely by coincidence, because when I wrote it, I didn't know it would be for him. Mm. Um, I managed to turn in a pretty decent script, I think. <laughs> um, and that one fortunately uh, set the ball rolling for the, for the rest of the run, which, of course, we did together. Mm. And it was there, I think, as I say, we, we really did hone that partnership, that telepathy, as I say. Um it surprises people sometimes when I tell them this, but we didn't really talk much <laughs> when we saw each other about work, mm. uh, at least in terms of what we were working on at that time, really because, as you said, we trusted each other. There was no need. Um, I didn't run coming to the ideas by him, uh, except occasionally I would tell him about a scene purely out of amusement. <laughs> um <laughs> But I was never running anything by him to see what he thought. Just as uh, he wouldn't show me character sketches or layouts or anything like that, uh, I suppose because each of us uh, was completely confident in uh, in the other. Mm. We we trusted each other implicitly, and. Uh, I, I like to think we never let each other down, really. That's that's how the partnership worked. When we met up and talked, it was about really anything but what we were doing at that particular time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, 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 we've, we've talked about your work together, but... Um, the one thing that's that's uh, as, as I said to some of the other guests, the one thing that's been so wonderful is hearing all these just legions of stories uh, about Steve and and uh, you know to, to, everyone's got a Steve Dillon story and I think that that's that's really very wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, what what are some of the, the 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 personal memories of your friendship and your time with Steve that that have come to mind um, over, over the last couple of weeks? Well, I I think. I think it's really what really dominated our friendship was our time in New York. Mm. Um, it was his idea that we come over here uh, for a long weekend back mm. at the start of 92. Um, uh, and that really set me on my life's course. And it was the time we spent together here. I think that, that means, means the most to me. Mm. Um, it, it's made it, unusually poignant, of course, uh, that uh, that it should be while he was over here that he passed on. Mm. Um, it's it's meant that I've seen a lot of uh, the, the old New York gang mm. uh, appear over the past few days. We've had a couple of get-togethers for Steve, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, his family have come over here, uh, and it's been nice for them to see... Uh, how much he meant to so many people so far away from home. Mm. Um, so that, I, I think, is, is is pretty much the way I'll always remember Steve, is uh, sitting next to him in, in one of a number of bars we love over here um, and just really drinking, talking, <laughs> suddenly realizing the sun had come up outside, uh, I'm not even sure I could kneel down one particular memory. If, if I did, maybe it would be the very first time we were here that he always enjoyed reminding me about when I was essentially walking around like a kid in his own wonderland, unable to stop staring up at me uh, at the tops of the buildings uh, and him laughing because he knew exactly how I felt. Mm. Uh, I think he'd had a similar experience the first time he'd come here a few years before that. Well, one one of the things that 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 has been coming through is um, you kind of referred to it there actually. How uh, you know you you never let each other down. Steve's professionalism, even with all these wonderful stories about pubs and drinking and you know having a riotous time and mm -hmm. everything, um, he never really let things slip. 
you know there was never there was never a uh, necessarily a time when uh he was subpar you know even even, even when mm. he wasn't firing on all cylinders it was still great stuff still great storytelling yes i think um i think he'd learned early on the value of professionalism mm. of getting the job done um there was more than one occasion where he would do an incredible job very fast and uh, convince a publisher who might have had very little experience of him uh, that yes, this was the guy uh, who would who would save everyone's bacon at the last minute, <laughs> no problem at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but to, yes, to to me that was obviously important. Um, he'd he'd managed to sort of win DC over mm. uh, with Screamer. I think where I think the schedule on that book was a bit iffy at times, but Steve, by pulling a series of all nighters, pulled everyone's fat out of the fire, uh, which was good because, of course, when when we wanted to work together on Hellblazer, they were happy to have him. Mm. And and um, certainly in the last few years, I mean, he'd, you know, he'd had some health problems. Um, it really mm-hmm. felt as if over the last couple of years, you know, he was he was back on form. He was, you know, as I said, firing on all cylinders. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's true. Um, that's one of the tragic aspects of this, that he, he was on his way back. Mm. Um, he had some health problems, but he seemed to have them under control. Uh, he was uh, working again uh, steadily and regularly and doing great stuff. I saw his work on, on Punisher with Becky Clunan. Mm. Um, he was enjoying the Preacher TV show. Um it's it's sad that just when things start to go right, um, he passes on like this. Mm. But on the other hand, it means that there's a sort of an upward tilt to the trajectory. Yeah. Um, people have a tendency to say, ah, oh, well, he was good once, but after that it was all gone. But that's not true in this case. Uh, things were looking up for him creatively and professionally mm. and I'm glad that he got he got to enjoy that last year I'm glad that he, he got to do work he enjoyed and uh, there, there was a sort of new life a new spirit in his work I thought um, I, I know that a lot of people um, were a little taken aback by, by his appearance I've seen some of the, the photographs he'd, he'd lost a good deal of weight and yet when you spoke to him uh, he was as sharp as ever mm. Uh, he, he was completely mentally engaged. Um, so I hesitate to say that he went out on a high note because that's a slightly grotesque thing to say, but at least he had, he had some good stuff going on. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd say that the worst days were behind him. Mm. Thinking back to that very first meeting in, I think, 1989 uh, that, that you said, yes. uh, was it, <clears throat> um, number one, that, that's a, a remarkable <laughs> feat of memory, um, but, but also, uh, did, you, did you feel at the time that the, that the two of you clicked, that there was a, a, a commonality of, of, sort of mind there? Um, not at the time, I just, I just thought he was a tremendously nice, friendly bloke, mm. and uh, I was very impressed by him, uh, also because we're, we're talking about the guy who drew Cry of the Werewolf and so <laughs> on, and, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to tell him how much it meant, and he was nice about that. Mm. It, it was, We didn't really have a proper chance to talk uh, until he'd moved to Dublin, mm. and that was when there was that almost audible click. Uh, I've said this to a couple of people who've asked over the past week, but it was that, I do recall that night uh, when everyone else had passed out and we were sitting there talking about what what we thought we could do in comics, what the medium could be used for. Um, unrealized potential mm. in comics, I suppose, is what we were addressing. And I do recall a mutual sense of, of oh yeah, you... You're the one. Yeah. You get it. I th- I think we can do something. I think we've got something together here. Mm. And uh, I mean, you 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 brought up Cry of the Werewolf, which is uh, routinely cited, uh, well, has been routinely cited over the last few weeks as 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 a massive favourite of of fans. Um, yes. 
have, having uh, read his stuff and not knowing Steve, what was what were some of the highlights for you of of, of his of his work at two thousand AD? Um, well, it, he did interesting work, powerful work on other things mm. like um, uh, Mean Arena mm. and Rogue Trooper, um, Abelhard Snaz. Uh, but really, if you're talking about 2000 AD, and for me, it is really 2000 AD. I, I didn't see Warrior or the Marvel UK stuff where I grew up. So it's really 2000 AD, and that means it's really dread. Mm. And that means that it's really the werewolves, um, <laughs> although alone in a crowd, and the Block Mania Orvok episodes. And you and I have talked before about City of the Damned. Yeah. Um, and and what a shame it is that that one didn't quite come off because mm. I thought Steve did some lovely work there. I think his episodes were by far the best. And I was thinking about this, how interesting it would have been to have an all Steve Dillon city of the damned. Mm. Uh, if you imagine him um, maybe handling the Ian Gibson episodes where Gibson, for all his talent, can't really bring out the horror uh, as effectively as another artist might of, of scenes of dread with his eyes torn out crawling through fire. Mm. Uh, you can imagine what Steve might have brought to that. Yeah. Um, I, I look at that incredible double page shot he did of dread telling the blue vampire judges uh, to get lost, yeah. and they do. <laughs> and I imagine the whole thing done to that standard. And, and who knows? Maybe, maybe proper commitment to the art and consistency to the to the art might have inspired John and Alan to finish the thing properly. You never can tell. Mm -hmm. um, but as it was, you know, we got some great stuff on that story, and we got the werewolves, yeah. which uh, which remain. You know, a, a high point uh, for Steve, a high point for Dredd, I think, certainly in that classic period. Well, that's all that we have time for on this particular episode of the Thrillcast. I want to thank Richard, John, John, Rufus and Garth for their time. We could fill many, many episodes of the Thrillcast with more tributes to Steve. In fact, it will probably justify an entire podcast series, such as been the outpouring of uh, grief and love and warmth towards him. Uh, it's just so wonderful to hear that everybody has uh, a Steve Dillon story and uh, just reinforces uh, what we as an industry, uh, what the fans, the readers uh, have lost uh, with Steve passing away and uh, our most heartfelt condolences from everybody at 2000 AD and Rebellion go out to his family and friends and indeed everybody who knew him, loved him, appreciated his work. Um, we have lost a titan of comics. So rest in peace, Steve.